Welcome to Lesson 35, which roughly covers pages 215 to 221 of the Automate the Boring Stuff with Python textbook. Now that you know enough to write more complicated programs, you might start finding not-so-simple bugs in them. The next few lessons cover some tools and techniques for finding the root cause of bugs in your program to help you fix your bugs faster and with less effort. Your computer will only do what you tell it to do. It won't read your mind and do what you intended it to do. Even professional programmers create bugs all the time. All the time. <laughs> so don't feel discouraged if your program has a problem. And Python raises an exception whenever it tries to execute invalid code. For example, a zero divide error happens when we try to divide a number by zero. And this doesn't make mathematical sense, so Python raises an exception. In previous lessons, you learned how to handle Python's exceptions with try and accept statements so that your program can recover from exceptions that you anticipated. But you can also raise your own exceptions in your code. Raising an exception is a way of saying, stop running this code in this function and move the program execution to the accept statement. Uh, exceptions are raised with a raise statement. So that's just the raise keyword, and then we'll call the exception function, passing it a string for an error message, and this will return an exception object that is raised. And the effect of this is the exact same as the other exceptions that were raised, except this is your own custom message that you can add to it. So if there are no try and accept statements covering the raise statement, the program simply crashes and displays the exception's error message. So let's do an example. Open up a new file editor window, and let's say we wanted to create a box printing function. So this would be a function that just prints out a box of characters that you supply it with. So say I wanted to create a kind of a longish box that looked something like this. Something that's just five lines tall and, what is this, probably about 15 or so wide. But not just this size, but any size box. So I want to create a function that we can pass it a symbol, just like the, the asterisk string in this box. Uh, and then we can also pass it an integer for the width and height. And when we call this box print function, it'll print out a box that looks like this. So this code is pretty simple. So first we need to print out the top line of that. So we'll just call print and we want to print out the symbol. We will use string replication with the asterisk operator to replicate this by width. And then we need to print out all the sides right here. We'll need to print out several of them. So let's create a loop for i in range and well, actually, it won't be height because it'll be height minus two because we don't want to count this line and this line. We just want to print out these and the top and bottom row will be included in the height. So let's loop over height minus two. So this will print each line. So again, we'll just print out symbol, but then we'll also need to print out a certain number of spaces. So I'm just going to have a white space character and use string replication multiplied by the height and then have symbol on the right side as well, right here. Except, just like this was height minus two, we also want this to be width minus two. And then after that we need to print the bottom line, so we'll just print out this again. So we can test this out. Let's call box print. Let's say I want to do asterisks, and I want it to be about 15 characters wide and five characters tall. I'll just save this as example.py and press F5 to run it. Hey, that's pretty nice. I can do this with lots of different things. I could say, uh, we'll just use a capital O instead, and I want to make a really tall and skinny box. So five characters wide and 16 characters tall. So that's nice. Here's the first one, and then here's the second one. So this function is working out pretty well. No bugs in it that we can see, except what if sometimes we accidentally pass it a string that has more than one character in it? Like, what if I pass it with two asterisks there? What happens then? Well, then we can see that actually this starts messing up. Now, clearly this is a bug. Our program hasn't crashed or anything, but it's not working the way that we want it to work. 
So instead, we could just detect these situations, you know, what happens if the length of symbol is not one, and then we could raise an exception to handle that. So I could have code that says if length of symbol does not equal one, in that case, we'll raise a new exception and we'll pass it a helpful error message, something like uh, symbol needs to be a string of length one. So now when we run this program, still with this bad symbol value that we're passing it, it now raises an exception and it gives us the error message. So this tells us, oh, there's something wrong with our code and it's good that we're detecting it now. It's better to fail fast and early so that way the program doesn't keep running and then it becomes harder to trace back the original cause of this bug. So there's a bunch of other things that we could check also, like say if we create a one by one box, that would actually kind of look a little bit weird and unexpected. We could add code to handle this case, or we could just say, well, when you call box print, the width and height have to be two or greater. So if width is less than two or height is less than two, then we'll just raise another exception. Width and height must be greater or equal to two. So that'll raise an exception when we pass it a width or height of one. So this entire error message is called a traceback. You can see it has the error message and also the kind of error right here, but it also has a whole bunch of other information as well. For one, it gives us a traceback, also called a call stack, and that shows you sort of the lines that were called before getting to the line that caused the error. So here at the bottom, you can see that line 16 inside the box print is what raised the exception. Here's that line of code. So you can see right here, this is line 16. This is where we rose this code, but how did we get to this code? Well, this box print function was called here on line 25, and that's being told to us right here. So this is very useful if you have a function that's called from multiple places, and you want to figure out from where it was called this one time when it caused this exception to be raised. That'll help you trace where the original cause of this bug is. Now you can get this text as a string value with the traceback.formatException function. So this is inside the traceback module, so we'll have to import that module first. And let's just have some example code. Let's just have a try. And all this does is just raises an exception. This is the error message. I just need some generic exception being raised. Then we can have an accept. Let's say this was in a, some program and we didn't want the exception to cause the program to crash or stop. We just wanted to write this exception text to some sort of log file and then keep the program running. So we could have something like error file equals, we'll just open up a new file called error log. We'll open this up in append mode so it just adds this content to the existing content in this file. And then error file dot write, get the string from the format exception function. And then just close this. And then maybe also just have a print message just to display this to the user. Trace back info was written to error log. Txt. When we run this code, this is going to enter a try block and then just raise this exception. And we've specified this code for the exception. So you can see this is from that print statement. And now if I go to, what is the uh, current working directory? Oh, okay. So this error log.txt file will be inside the current working directory because I just passed it a relative file path here. So I'm just going to copy this and then hit Windows R and I'll just open this in the file explorer. And you see right here there's an error log.txt file. I can open this up in a, in a text editor. So this is kind of nice. And even if we run this, pro, uh, this code multiple times, you can see because we have run it using append mode, all this log text just gets written to that file. 
So even if we had multiple errors happening, we wouldn't lose any of them. We would always have a permanent record here in this text file. Next, let's cover assertions. An assertion is a sanity check that makes sure your code isn't doing something obviously wrong. These sanity checks are performed by assert statements. If the sanity check fails, then an assertion error exception is raised. So the assert statement is simply just the assert keyword followed by a condition. And if this condition evaluates to false, then it raises the, assert, uh, the assertion error. And we can specify uh, an error message as well. This is the error message. So you can see this condition will always evaluate to false since it's just the false value. And it basically looks like this. Assertion error is just another kind of exception. Let's have an example. I'm going to open up a new file editor window, and let's say we were creating some sort of simple traffic simulator program. And in this program, we have uh, intersections with stoplights. I'm going to say this variable market and second will represent the stoplights at the intersection of market and second street. We'll just have a simple data structure for this stoplight. We'll just say in the north-south direction, the stoplight is green, and in the east-west direction, the stoplight is red. So we can change the values in this dictionary data structure to reflect whatever the current state of that stoplight is. So I could later change this to yellow or red or whatever. And now let's say for as part of our program, we wanted to create a function that will switch the lights. What happens when a light switch happens? We want it to modify these data structures. So let's just say um, We'll just pass it intersection, and this intersection parameter will basically just be a, a data structure like we have here in markets in second. So later here, we're going to just call this switch lights function and then pass it some dictionary data structure like market in second. So, okay, let's think about what happens here. Um, let's have a for loop for key in intersection dot keys. Because we want to run the same switching uh, light switching code on the north-south key and also the east-west key. So we'll just have a loop and key will be, the key variable will be set to either the string north-south or the string east-west. And the code would look something like this. Uh, it's pretty obvious. Let's say um, if the intersection key, so if key was set to north-south, this would be the this would be the green string. So let's say, you know, if that's set to green, then what we want to do is set it to the light that comes after green, which is yellow. And then if that light, oh, else if that light was yellow, we want to set it to red. And if the intersection light for either north, south, or east, west was set to red, we would want to set it to green. Now this code seems to make a lot of sense. Uh, fairly simple. Let's just save this as example.py. And then you write the rest of your traffic simulation program. But when you actually start running it, all these virtual cars in the program keep crashing into each other and you don't know why. If you're just looking at this code right now, you might not even see the bug that's right here. Here, I'll show you what it is. We can just say uh, print out market in second, and then when we call switch lights, let's print out what market in second looks like afterwards. You can see right now it's a green light in the north-south direction and a red light in the east-west direction. But now when I run this, you can see, okay, first time, yeah, green and red, that's fine and green lights are turned to yellow lights, and red lights are turned to green lights. So the program hasn't crashed or anything, but let's think about this. There's traffic going in the north-south direction and the east-west direction. Obviously what we want to have happen is this should turn to yellow, but red doesn't turn to green until that yellow has turned to red. This is a pretty subtle bug. We didn't pick up on it, but we could have if while we were writing this, we just call an assert statement and just have some function that has to be true, a sanity check that as a condition that evaluates to true. And if it doesn't, there is obviously something wrong. So let's say the string red has to be in the values of stoplight. 
And if not, we want to raise an assertion error. And the error message that we'll pass is neither light is red. And we can just print out. And we can just print out the uh, dictionary data structure as well. So now, if we had written this when we had, when we had first started, we will immediately find out. Oh, there is a problem in the switch lights code. Oh, whoops. Mistype this. So now when we run this code, we can see that there is some sort of error. It's telling us neither light is red, and it's also showing us what that data structure is. And we can see, oh, right, that's going to be a problem when we run this traffic simulator program if there is traffic going in both directions. So in plain English, an assert statement is saying, I assert that this condition always holds true. And if not, there is clearly a bug somewhere in the program. Unlike exceptions, your code shouldn't handle assert statements with try and accept. If the assert fails, your program should crash. And by failing fast like this, you shorten the time between the original cause of the bug and when you first notice the bug. This will reduce the amount of code that you have to check before figuring out what is causing the bug. Now, assertions are for programmer errors, not user errors. For errors that can be recovered from, such as a file is not found, or a user entered invalid data, or something that can be expected, raise an exception instead of detecting it with an assert statement. Now, the exact circumstances of when you should use an assert statement, or when you should use a raise statement to raise an exception, uh, is up for debate. But as long as you're doing something to detect error states in your program, that will really help you by letting you find out about errors sooner rather than later. You can also use assertions with an assert statement. And assertions are for detecting programmer errors that are not meant to be recovered from. That's why we often say assertions are sanity checks. We never expect them to actually be, uh, be raised. However, user errors should raise exceptions. 